Members, we often hear the expression, we can't get there from here, or we can't put the genie back in the bottle, or we've reached the point of no return. And those phrases are often just rationalizations of some way that we're trying to dissuade our disapproval of a situation that we believe we can't change. But you see the beauty, the beauty of what we're doing in this chamber, the beauty of our system that our forefathers have set up for us is that we can change. We can change things. We can change direction. And when we look at all the problems we have in this state, most of us are all on the same page for affordable housing, for education, for health care, for the environment. We differ. We differ on the way we believe those problems can be solved, but we all recognize them as being problems that we all face. But there is a problem in our society today that we differ on its existence, and that is the deterioration of our culture. And it is a problem that we need to face. And I'm going to depersonalize it because it has nothing to do with any individual. It doesn't have anything to do with any of the people that we're dealing with this in this bill. It has to deal with our society. And let's look at it. Today, we have more mental health issues, particularly in our children, than ever before. We have more incidences of suicide in our young people, in our children, in young girls, 11 to 13 years old, than we have ever had in our history. And in a society with all our technological advances, we have the Library of Commerce, right, uh, Congress right here in our hands, each and every day. We have every convenience imaginable, every resource, and yet we have in our society more dysphoria than we have ever had in history. And we have to stop, and we have to ask why. Because otherwise, we're like that frog in the water that believes that there's no problem, and we're slowly, as the water slowly heats, we're getting boiled. And we try to normalize it by creating all kinds of names and words and medical conditions. And then we try to excuse the behavior that we feel is wrong by saying, oh, it's just freedom. And then we try to criticize those who disagree with us and call them all kinds of things like homophobic and misogynistic, racist, sexist, and even say they're religious right-wing extremist in some way to try to shut down the debate in the conversation. Well, I want to take a little aside and talk about religion since it was brought up so many times today on this floor. Yesterday, we had a prayer breakfast. And in that prayer breakfast, we heard from both sides of this chamber talk about how our power comes from God. And I'll tell you something that I believe, members, and you don't have to believe it, but I believe it. I believe everyone on this earth believes in God, even the atheist. They just believe that's who they are. We need to stop and think a little bit about what we can do to change our culture. And so I actually believe it's our duty. It's something that we need to address because there's evil in our society, and you've heard it. Chair Fine has made a point to say it several times in the last couple days. And that evil is so insidious that we fail to recognize it. It is truly the wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's going after our most vulnerable population, our children. And we need to recognize it. We need to recognize the sources of dysphoria in our kids because they are unhappy. They are discontent. 
they are not satisfied with their self. And I don't know really what the difference is between knowing something and thinking something. But they think that they truly aren't who they are. And I'll give you that. I'll cede that to you. But I will also say, like so many things that we do in our world, we try to fill that void with emptiness. And the statistics don't lie. The facts are always true. And let's see what they do. Well, this discontent, this gender dysphoria that we're talking about today, this void, what, how's it changed through time? 30 years ago, you never even heard of it. It wasn't even a condition. The DSM-3, the, the manual that I used for psychiatry when I was in medical school, described it only as a psychological anomaly. It was only something that was psychologically driven. There is still, even today, no physiologic evidence, no evidence in our bodies for those individuals that are gender dysphoric. So why in the world would we think to treat a psychological condition with pharmacological drugs that affect the physiology? And see, we've made a mistake. We thought, oh, all these drugs we're using are reversible. We're finding more and more and more in other countries in the world that got a head start on us that they're not reversible. And so what is the incidence of this gender dysphoria? How has it changed? In the last 30 years in some countries, it's increased 5,000%. And I will challenge you to find one other disease state that has those type of incident numbers. In the United States, gender dysphoria, since many of us who are seniors stepped foot on this floor the, for the first time in 2017, has increased 300%. And that rate of increase is exponential, ladies and gentlemen. If we don't step in, and turn our society and address our culture, I can't even imagine what it'll be when the freshmen that are so brilliant and on this floor today step off for the last time. It's our duty. It's our duty. And so what have been the consequences of what we thought was a good idea of treating a psychological condition with physiologic drugs. Well, here's what's happened. As we treat kids and block their normal progression into puberty, we've seen irreversible bone damage. We've seen irreversible brain damage. We've seen incidences of tumors in the brain. We've seen incidences of cardiovascular anomalies that are irreversible. And what they're finding, the very, the very people that have advocated for this type of treatment are finding that those individuals cannot have sexual satisfaction. And I'm not going to use the word that starts with the letter O because you all understand and know what that is. But they can't ever achieve that. Now think about that just for a minute because it's, it's terrible. And why are we treating these kids with this? Well, let's look at that normal child that has gender dysphoria, because that's usually not all they have. They almost always have comorbidities that could be autism, they could be depression, it could be anxiety, emotional issues, they could have problems at home or other problems in their environment. And yes, they need therapy, but they need mental health counseling. They don't need us to screw up their sex. They don't need us to screw up their physiology. That's the truth. That's things we can't change. And we need to fight for this because not because we're a conservative, religious, right-wing legislature. We need to fight for this because it's right. Now, we've heard some things about insurance companies, and here's my answer to that. 
What they should do is the money they're spending right now on transgender care, they should move it over and use it for mental health because that's something that we need more so than probably we realize. And for those individuals that feel that this, this type of therapy is well proven, there are study after study after study that refutes the studies and study after study after study that actually show that what they've done is horribly wrong. And I will tell you, this will go down is one of the most tragic medical maladventures of our time. Mark my words. Has there been any animal studies? Most experts believe that non-human animals, I almost hate using that term, not because I don't consider us an animal in a sense of another type of animal. We're a human being, and we're special in the sight and eyes of God. They cannot have issues with gender identity. Anthony Fauci tried a study that was financed with your taxpayer dollars through the NIH. He wanted to give feminizing hormones to monkeys to try to see if those monkeys react similarly to HIV as transgender women. The only issue with the study was is the monkeys he was giving the hormones to aren't susceptible to HIV virus. So that was $205,000 of your taxpayer money that went down the drain. So I'm going to stop now, but just I want to leave you with this. It's been a pleasure and an honor for me to work with Representative Fine on this bill because I actually believe it's one of the most important bills we're going to pass this year. We need to change culture. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, if there's a hill to climb, and one to die on, that's where we need to be. Because it's for our children, it's for our future. I'll yield the rest of my time.